Hello everyone at Euroscientist. This is Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan and today I'm here with Steven Lorez, head of the Coma Science Group at the Giga Consciousness Center at Liège University in Belgium. Steven was my guest on episode number 15 of this podcast. It's nice to see you back. Nice to see you. So we talked about the importance of technology in this specific field of research. Of course, it's key. You only do it thanks to the availability of these types of machines today. But where does this technology come from? So for a scientist, having access to the latest technologies is just tremendously important. What made Galileo such a good scientist is that he had good telescopes. So now we just try to zoom in on the brain, so we need brain scanners, that's PET, positron emission tomography, MRI, functional MRI, and then these devices I can show that are more um, transportable, measuring the electrical activity of the brain. So um, I'm very happy that with the team here in Liège, in Belgium, we can interact with some of the best companies in Europe. We have GTEC in Austria offering us um, brain computer interfaces. So that's basically measuring the brain's activity, in our case, after coma, and trying to establish a functional communication with patients who can't speak, who can't move, and really translating this scientific knowledge to clinical settings and doing that together with partners from the industry. We see this technology getting smaller and smaller. This is one company here from Israel, Neurosteer, offering us a wearable. You basically put this on your forehead and on my smartphone, I can have a real-time analysis of the electrical brain waves. So for us, very good to work with them. We now can also stimulate the brain. So this is an example of what we call transcranial direct current stimulation. So we now have electrodes that not just measure the brain's activity, but can influence it with very weak electrical currents. So this is a company in Spain, and it's uh, the uh, StarLab, StarStim system, that for us, again, with the team, gives us tremendous opportunities, in this case within a European uh, project that's called Luminous, again, always trying to understand this huge mystery that is understanding consciousness, human consciousness in particular. So if I wore this and a person in a coma wore this, uh, would the what's the striking difference? So the damaged brain, coma, where we have traumatic brain injury or brain hemorrhage or cardiac arrest, it's a huge and very frequent problem in Europe. And these damaged brains, in terms of electricity, would classically show a very slow um, frequency. A little bit like your brain when you're in deep anesthesia or in deep sleep. But here the brain is damaged, so we need to, first of all, use all these brain signals to try and reduce the uncertainty about the capacity of this brain to generate consciousness. It's very important because it means that the chances of recovery are higher, but also it means that this is a perceiving brain. So we should give painkillers. It's ethically very important. We should increase our rehab efforts. And every brain for example, in case of traumatic brain injury, the damages are so different. Every time it's a different story. And we need to take the, in this case, electrical signature of that damage and its functional impact into account and help clinicians, as myself and the team here, to better target our uh, therapeutic options. You work in a university hospital, so you have access to the best facilities possible. Why is that wearable device important to you? I think that the last 20 years or so, we've seen more and more scientific interest. 
and a lot of papers being published. And I'm very proud of the team because they've been very productive. But we need to do more than that. We now need to translate that scientific knowledge to really an impact in terms of patients' quality of life. So this needs to be really a translation of, you know, going from bench to bedside. And it really should now happen that our European hospitals, all of them, not just the centers of excellence in some academic centers, all of the patients within Europe suffering, for example, from traumatic brain injury that is still the first cause of death and the first cause of severe handicap in Europe, really we should make an impact in terms of patients' quality of life. And so that needs these technologies to be more widely available, to be less expensive. And also, I see in medicine of today and tomorrow a more active role for patients. And in my case, it's the patient's families. And so these devices, they become smaller, they become easier to use. And this is going to be really important. It's going to give patients and their families a more active role and in some cases a voice that really as clinicians we should be taking into account. For monitoring purposes, self-monitoring. Absolutely, so we see it already happening. I have a smart uh, watch here, it's monitoring my heart rate right now, it's measuring my movements, but soon we will also have these devices give me information about my mental brain activity. With this device, some weeks ago, I ran the New York Marathon and it was measuring and I could see on my smartphone the whole time what was going uh, on inside. So these are now just pilot projects, proof of principles. It's tremendously difficult when you move, when you sweat to measure the brain's electrical activity. That's very, very weak. But we see now these companies already offer us the tools that can do it and it's getting better and better. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. And so I think the labs, the scientists such as myself, should just increase our interactions with our partners um, in Europe and then share our areas of expertise so that European citizens will benefit from it the sooner the better. Congratulations on running the marathon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Could you also record the data or this app for now just shows you? No, no. So this is, this is being recorded. It's going to give us a lot of work. I did it with my son. Actually, it was a birthday present for his 18 years. It was a great family experience. And it's also a scientific project where the engineers are still looking uh, and trying to make sense with the data. But technically, it worked. We're tremendously happy. And um, yeah, extra work for the team. Now that stimulates your brain. How much to stimulate? What you can do to the brain when you stimulate it directly, like this, you know, with a substance or something, I think it may open up, you know, um, explorations, not just in rehabilitation and patient treatment, which is very important, but leisure, increased creativity. Possible? Well, you're absolutely right. If you would Google this on YouTube, you would see movies, how to make this myself and how to become super smart. Uh. And, and then, <laughs> you know, students trying to learn quicker. Uh, that's tricky. I think my role as a physician is trying to help patients and diseases, the damaged brain, um, when we talk about coma. I don't want to create some human 2.0 or super consciousness or whatsoever. We indeed need to define an ethical framework. When we're studying human consciousness, one of the biggest mysteries for science to solve, there's the possibility that, you know, you use this knowledge not necessarily for positive actions on society and humanity. And that's true for all of science. You can use radioactivity to cure and to make bombs. So it's the key to heaven and hell and us society need to define the framework. And that's being done, of course, everything done uh, worldwide in 
laboratories is being reviewed by ethical boards. And that's very important. It's something where as scientists we need to discuss with ethicists, with legal scholars. Um, we're talking about brain-computer interfaces, trying to decode, to read your mind. Currently, we use this for specific patient populations, but imagine we could use this in other contexts, the military, and uh, we need to anticipate to think about it. The same for the stimulation of the brain. Um, we all know the historical errors, you know, when we put electrodes into the brain, when we did electroshock um, treatments. So all of that really needs to be done in a very transparent way, reviewed by ethical boards, but... I also think it's very important that we, as scientists, give these vulnerable patients access to the technology. Sometimes it can be so that because it is not trivial, because it is difficult, that as a scientist we could just say, oh, I'm not going to do it. And that would also be ethically wrong. I think it's very important that we have the courage to openly discuss what is possible and how we can do it by, you know, uh, going through ethical boards, making sure we're doing good for patients. And that requires transparency, openness, and also sometimes courage and creativity, which sometimes uh, with the paperwork can be uh, sometimes kind of a burden. And it's important not to go to an overkill. For example, the patients I see really should benefit from these technologies. And we know from the past that sometimes we made it too difficult. My wife is pregnant right now. And, well, pregnant women also become sick, become ill, and then they need to take medication. And it's very hard to do clinical trials on pregnant women. And so we need to protect them, but also we need to think of ways to still do this so that actually we can take care of uh, all these vulnerable people, patients who are comatose, pregnant women, children. And so historically, maybe um, we made the mistake to do some science, some clinical trials only in a very specific population and then we just simply lack the information when a child is sick and would need that drug. So it's, it's really a trade-off. And I think the only way forward is to be very transparent and to work with ethics committees that also have the courage to you know, decide which is the framework to make it possible, not to, I would say, auto-censor or, or consider some areas as... Um, impossible to do any research uh, in because I think then we would we would not do good. If I may, one last question on this front: Is Europe aligned with the rest of the world, or it's more protective? And maybe researchers like yourself in North America, other places, are not loaded with that administrative burden, so research is moving faster. You know without any judgment on this, just practically? Is Europe aligned with the rest of the world? Well, of course, I'm a European, and I would like to see more Europe. Now Europe is still divided. And um, what we see is that we... I need to go through local ethics committees, and then they would be, uh, like, supervised by European instances. And I think the strength of, like... Uh, the United States is that truly they are a United States of America, um, where here in Europe we still suffer from, okay, this is Belgium, this is France, Germany, and so we have these European guidelines and then there's the national implementation, and sometimes there's small differences between countries where I would like Europe to be stronger, to speak with one voice, you know, Brexit is there. It's not the best uh, timing to talk about that. But I think um, 
it would make sense and it would make us stronger to really see a United States of Europe and to truly have more collaboration still than is currently the case. There are differences. We collaborate with China, with India. So again, I think it's very important in Europe we're in a good place to, to learn from the past. Not so long ago we did bad things to patients. So we need these ethics committees and we need to find the right balance to make it possible to do sometimes difficult research and to do it well. And the only way forward is to just have the transparency and the public debate. And so podcasts like this are very important. And I would like to see more science in the media and radio and television because it's just so exciting. And we're all part of it. So now we have data. We all put our data on the internet. We share them with our colleagues. And these data need to be protected in such a way that we can still do our job and yet that citizens have their rights and privacy. So it's, I think, a work in progress all the time because technology advances and so the guidelines need to follow. Um, and that is possible through the dialogue where I'm very happy that my team is an active player and so far I definitely can't complain about the European regulation, but let's keep the administrative burden still possible for us scientists to deal with. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me today in Liège. And good luck with the new baby. Thank you.